Hi, this is David Zima. Thanks for tuning in to one of our voiceover classes. These clips come from our actual classroom in New York City, and I have edited them into short segments. This particular topic is stages of learning and the types of learning and the things you need to focus on to learn the performing arts skills that are involved in voiceovers. And I feel that this particular session will help you adopt the right attitude and the right philosophy for learning any kind of performing art, and especially voiceovers. There'll be a lot of tips to help you learn voiceovers. And as I said, these are actual clips from our classroom in New York City, so you may hear an occasional cough or sneeze or NYPD siren. But it shouldn't interfere with your listening, and it should actually make you feel that you're right there in the room with us. Also, there's a transcript available of the session, which you can download. Please settle in, be ready to take notes, and we'll take you to our classroom in New York City. There are three kinds of learning that I want to talk about first. Maintenance learning is the first kind of learning we want to write down. Maintenance learning. This is just the learning that keeps you up to date in your field. Your field is always changing, no matter what field you're in. If you're in the field of nursing, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, there are always changes. And the changes are much faster now, nowadays, because of the internet and all of this other communication technology that we have. The changes are happening so much faster. You could take a three-month vacation from your job and come back and find a significant amount of changes. You could take one year off of your job and find out that you needed to learn everything over again. So maintenance really is the only kind of learning that keeps you up to date. In voiceovers, your maintenance learning is going to be staying in touch with the websites like AdAge and AdWeek to learn about what's happening in the advertising business, to stay in touch with the trade papers, the broadcast trade papers, etc. Most of these have websites now, so if you're surfing the web, you can get some of the information relatively inexpensively. So you're saying continuing education? Maintenance of, of your field, continuing education. You may need to practice every day. That's part of maintenance, etc. Working in a class that forces you to get up in front of people on microphone is a good idea, too. That's part of maintenance. You know, dancers take dance classes to stay in shape between performances and just the basic maintenance of their skills, etc. Now, the second kind of education, though, is growth education. This adds a new skill or improves on a skill that needs improved upon. So this is different than maintenance. This you need to take an additional class, work with a coach, etc. Say you started out doing commercials, but now you want to do industrials and narrations and you don't know exactly quite how to do it. Or let's say you want to develop characters. These would be growth skills. Okay, and you would work with somebody in a class or in a coaching situation to add or improve those skills. Say you've been out there auditioning, but you haven't booked anything. You may want to work with a coach to learn how to audition better. A lot of times people book one job and they think they know everything. They think they've graduated. The booking is really the first of it. You may need to learn how to take direction better. You may need to learn how to get to what they want quicker. So you may need skills, mic skills or studio skills. So some people need audition skills, people need studio skills, and some people want to add things, like we said, characters, etc. So those are the growth learning stages. The next kind of learning is shock learning. Shock learning. We've all touched the hot stove at one time and found out not to do it again, right? Shock learning is something that reverses or contradicts what you thought. You thought the stove was cold. Well, then you realize it's not always cold. There are times when it's hot. It's something unexpected. It either comes after a success or a failure, and it can actually be turned around to become a breakthrough. For example, you're all familiar with those 3M post-it notes? Okay. 3M was working on a super glue that would bond to anything and never come off. They worked on it and worked on it, and guess what? They failed. They found that they made this glue that would stick and pull right off. They made the opposite. And they thought, you know, we've spent all of this money on this glue that doesn't stick permanently. We wanted a permanent stick glue. What could we do to turn this around? And somebody thought, what are the times when you don't want something to stick permanently? And somebody thought of the idea of the post-it. Why don't we just stick a little note onto a memo? 
and we don't want the memo, the note to stay on the memo, so we want the glue to be imperfect, and we don't want it to destroy the writing on the memo. And so what they thought was a failure was turned around into a success. They created these little post-it notes, and they first test marketed them on the other offices of 3M, and they sent them around to the other offices, and the requests came flooding in. And they finally said, well, from now on, send all of your requests to the marketing department. Let them know what a success this is. So this was shock learning. They found out that they didn't know how to make a super glue. <laughs> they made a glue that didn't work, but turn, turned it around, made lemonade from the lemon. So shock learning happens all the time. You go to an audition. You decide to go over here first and see Susan, and you're not ready. And she rips you to shreds. <laughs> and so you go home, and you cry, and you get out of the business. No. You go home. You pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and you start over again. Okay. A lot of times it takes an audition like that to really let you see what you needed to know. A number of years ago, I happened to audition for one of the top four casting directors, you know, the top four known for being pretty rough and tough. So I went to audition for this one, and she just practically told me that she would buy me a plane ticket out of town. <laughs> so... I was auditioning for something on camera, and I had really mostly had voiceover experience, so I wasn't quite ready. So instead of taking her up on the offer to get out of town, I went and got a lot of training. So a couple of years go by, and I auditioned for her again. It was a big elaborate commercial. She had the whole room set up. I had to run around and do all kinds of different things. And I was working with another woman, and at the end of the take, the lady was asking her for some direction. And she said, well, you know, I was really focusing on what David was doing. So I was so interested in what he was doing, but I didn't really get to see what he were doing. So pretty much stole the scene. <laughs> I let her know that I knew what I was doing and that I didn't take that money and, and go out of town. I took the money and put it into training to get new skills, to add and improve and grow. But that was from shock. That was shock learning. You see, and you can turn it around. Okay. So it's okay sometimes to get burned. And sometimes people need to learn that way. All right, now the other part of learning that we're going to talk about are the, the four stages of learning. Now this is different. There are the three types of learning, and now it's the four stages of learning. I found these written up by a person named Richard Schultz, and I thought they would quite apply to what we're doing here. First stage is unconscious incompetent. You could say there are many people out there who are unconsciously incompetent. There are people who don't know that they don't know something. And that's when the shock comes in. That's where shock learning comes in handy. Because it wakes you up and you realize, oh, wow, there's something I don't know. That's what happens after the shock. Okay, so you really sometimes think that you know everything, but you don't. The next stage becomes consciously incompetent. So then you realize you're consciously incompetent. You are brand new. You're trying to learn something. You know you're not doing it very well. You're a kid trying to tie a shoe and you have to think about every time and every move of tying the shoe. And half the time you do it wrong. Okay, so you're consciously incompetent. And you're struggling to do something. Or you're up here, you're reading copy, and you're trying to remember to move your hands. You're thinking too much, and it ends up sounding stilted and choppy and whatever. Okay, or you think the tone that you're producing is a pleasant one, but the tone is coming out angry. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, it can happen. Or you think that you're putting out enough energy and it sounds really monotone. Okay, So you become consciously incompetent once the coach tells you, that sucked. <laughs> well, the coach isn't going to say that, but you know, he'll give you a critique. Okay, the next stage then becomes conscious competence. You practice. You get up every day and you learn how to do it. Soon you're getting good at tying the bow most of the time. You know, most of the time you're successful, but you still have to think about tying that shoe, tying that knot. And you're not free to think of other things, okay? Because you're always concentrating so hard on getting that right. The next stage when you're up here too, people sound too deliberate when they're speaking. They're thinking too much about what they want to do. They're trying too hard, whatever. Okay, so it has to come easily. The next stage, then, is unconscious competence. You've reached a new level with enough practice, okay? You tie your shoes without even thinking about it at all. You can plan and then replan 
while you're talking to someone else. Someone's asking you, well, what are you going to do today? And you're tying that shoe and you miss a step and you just, you fix it. You don't have to start all over again. Or you don't get frustrated if you did have to start over again. In auditioning or in mic technique, often we, we do what we call justify. If we make a mistake on something, if we uh, make a pause too long, we, in acting, we call it justify. We make the pause work. We transpose the sentence. We rewrite the sentence slightly to make it work if we flubbed a word or left out a word, or something. Actors on stage do justifying all the time because they blew a line, they went up on a line, they left out a paragraph, whatever. They went upstage over here when they were supposed to go downstage, etc. So they make it work. And that's what you need to do. Remember we said that when you handle the mistake, it says whether you're a pro or not a pro. If you do a pickup, it helps you to get back on track. If you just fluff a word, you just let it go. Just stay focused. But if it really blows you, you, you can ask to start over again. Okay, so the best stage that we really need up here is a blend of conscious competence and unconscious competence. We do need to be somewhat aware of what we're doing, but we can't be so focused on it that it sounds stilted. So the awareness of what we're doing helps us to do what we call the justifying, the course corrections. We're not making judgments. If you're up here doing your critique, it's the wrong time. The time to do the critique is when you play back. Okay. Save the critique for later. In other words, critique means, oh, bad. Shouldn't have done that. You know, oh, good. That sounded good. So either you fall in love with what you're doing or you're always judging it negatively. Neither one works. What works best is to say, I need to fix this. Let me do it now. That's the kind of, only kind of judgment to make when you're performing. Got to fix it. Do it now. You know, and stay in the focus. Big mistake that people make is that they try to be word perfect. They try to get every word of the copy right. The casting directors don't really care if you flub one word or if you dropped a the or an a uh or something. It's better to get the attitude right, to get the attitude perfect. So then they don't even notice that you flubbed the word because the tone is right, the attitude is right, etc. I'm not saying that you should go in and rewrite the copy. Then it would be too obvious. But I'm saying don't worry if you just flub one or two words. Not a big deal. Chances are everyone there that day flubbed that same word. But I've had casting directors come in here all the time and say that. You know, we don't care if you miss a little word. We know you've only looked at it for 10 or 15 minutes. Pretty much everyone is blowing the same word because it's, it's a hard sentence structure. It's a hard thing for the, the muscles of the mouth to produce. So that's why you need to practice your tongue twisters every day, etc. So get a good book of tongue twisters. Be practicing that every day. Your practice should vary every day so that you're doing voiceover copy for part of it. If you're practicing to be a narrator, pick up the New York Times for the science section. There's some really good articles to read out loud. There are plenty of scripts online on the pbs.org website on the NOVA part of it. Just search NOVA for transcripts, and you'll find a lot of scripts that are interesting to read. You'll learn a lot of information, too. <laughs> okay, any questions about the learning stages and the types of learning? No, what are the four stages again? Unconscious, incompetent. Somebody doesn't know something at all, and they don't know that they don't know it. Yeah, and then you've got conscious incompetence, when you find out that you don't know something, and you're very aware of it. And then conscious competence, when you can do it well, and you're aware that you can do it well. And then unconscious competence. Most people, when they're driving, are unconsciously competent. You know, how many times are you listening to the radio, right, driving, or some people nowadays are on the phone, right? You're driving, and you're listening to the radio, and you're looking at the billboards and the signs, and all of a sudden, your turn is coming up here, and you make your turn. You know it's there. You weren't even thinking about it, though, were you? So you can drive and do something else at the same time. I'm not saying that you can get up here and do voiceovers and your homework. <laughs> do voiceovers and write a book at the same time. No. <laughs> it's just that you'll be able to, all of this stuff that seems awkward now, moving your hands, all that will blend together. You'll be able to do that. And in the beginning, people were, oh, I forgot to move my hands. But you see, it, it will become more natural. And so don't quit if it's unnatural. If it seems awkward. You have to master the technique before you can say, this doesn't work for me. Because now you know how to do it. It should be awkward in the beginning. It should be strange. In the it's, just weird. it's like riding a bicycle or swimming or anything. Anyway, okay. The next thing I want you to jot down are the biggest 
problems with unprofessional actors or new people in the field is that they are inconsistent. When I used to produce a lot of training tapes and in-house educational programs, and a lot of times they didn't have the budget to hire actors, and they wanted me to grab people who worked at the organization to be in the production. The thing that I learned about people who didn't have any acting skills or experience is they, A, had no patience for retakes, that they would usually peak about take three and get worse thereafter. So if you didn't get it in the first three takes, it usually didn't work at all. And they usually got very nervous as soon as they knew the camera was rolling. So what I used to do was not tell them the camera was rolling and say that we were just walking through it or rehearsing it. And I would tape the walkthrough and the rehearsal, which will ultimately be the most natural one that they gave me and almost always the one that I would end up using for the final footage. Because take one would be too nervous. Take two was getting progressively worse. And take three was the, about the best they were going to do with it. And take four, they wanted to go home. You know, so, <laughs> so you don't want to be a non-professional actor and come out with those problems. Okay. The director is going to pretty much pull his hair out and send you home. Okay. So some of the other problems. Let's see. What were some other problems here? Oh, that they're inconsistent. They start into a character and it, they don't, they're not able to sustain it from take to take. Or even in the same piece of copy. Sometimes I'll ask somebody to do an accent and they'll be all over the map with it. So that was a very well-traveled person, you know. <laughs> uh, but it's very fragmentary in the sense their performance is not consistent enough. So that's another big problem that directors face with non-professional actors. And you want to make sure that you get to the level where you are consistent and you can repeat what you did from take to take. Another thing that I would notice is when I would tell people, okay, that was great, that was the best one. Now we need another one for insurance that has to be equally as good in case I missed something on that take and I want to match and edit. And invariably, they would, if you once told them that was the best they had done, they would on the next take, fall right down and not be as good. So even when you have done what the director has said is the best and he needs to take for insurance, you have to match your best. Okay. So if there's a lot of work that you need to do to get to those points. The other point that you need to know as a performer is you need to know when you're on and when you're off, especially if you're doing telephone work nowadays. I had a director who was over the telephone once and... She said, okay, this is the direction I want you to go and this is what I want you to do. Do some takes and call me back and play the best ones for me. And I played her like three takes. And the one I thought was the best, I think it was take seven. And she, she's on the other phone line. She hears it. She says, okay, I heard those three takes. Use take seven. That was the one I liked the best. So you have to know when you have communicated what they asked you to communicate. When you were on and when you were off. So that takes a lot of learning too and a lot of knowing. Because it's going to be important when you're in a session. Okay. Because if you don't know when you're off, it's hard for you to take direction. Is it? That's a problem for beginners too. They don't hear it. So this is almost as much about developing your ear as it is about developing your voice. You have to be able to hear things. Voiceovers is, is all nuances. There are casting directors who have come here and said that voiceovers are really all about the nuances. And the producer who was here the other night said that the copywriters are listening for every word. It's almost like there are no unimportant words. Because when you realize they're spending millions of dollars for airtime, or even if it's an industrial that they're just sending out to their employees, they've spent a lot of money on producing it. So there are no unimportant words that they want to communicate to the general public to sell a product or to their employees about a new program that they have to learn or something. So we have to find out how to bring out the words. I don't use the word punch in teaching at all anymore because punch is something old-fashioned from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. I call it bringing out the words emotionally, giving each word its moment, its life, etc. So we have to find the exact way to bring out each word in that sentence okay? and, and what communicates, you know, what the author wanted it to communicate. So it's very important to develop that sense with the copy. The people who work every day are people who can pick up a piece of copy and think of immediately three different ways to do it and make it work in those three different ways. So... That's why you need to research thousands of commercials. You have to realize that the people you are competing against have been doing it for five years, 10 years, 20 years maybe. Okay. Because most of the people who have been doing it for one year probably quit at the end of that year. 
<laughs> you know, they, they gave up too soon. People get frustrated if they don't get an audition right away or if they don't get a job right away. It takes time. The thing you should be asking yourself is, well, what can I do to get an audition? Maybe my skills need to be looked at first. People always tend to put it outside of themselves. Well, it's the marketplace. It's this, it's that. No, well, why not look at yourself first and say, well, what can I do? You know, maybe I need to send out more cards. Maybe I need to make an improvement or more training, whatever. And, and then the other thing is when you go to an audition, they don't tell you what you did wrong. They just smile and say thank you. Well, that's true. It's not, they're not there to teach you. You're not paying them for a class. Yeah, and they're... Right. Yeah. I mean, we used to say that. And yeah, I know. It would be helpful for them to play it back for you, but they don't have time. It's not a class. That's why you need to go to class because... And that's why you need to know when you're on and off. But you could do a fabulous audition and, and not get the job just because you weren't right for other reasons or somebody else did an equally good job and for whatever reason you're new and they know that person. They know that person is reliable. They're going to go with reputation and reliability. So don't fault yourself then. You just have to get more known. The thing that the other mistake I think people make is they put too much into that audition. They, they, they get one audition maybe a week and they're oh, and they're all day thinking about that audition. Oh, are they going to call? Oh, the phone's ringing. <laughs> you know, it's, don't focus on that one audition. It's only one audition. Focus on getting the next one. The best way to treat the audition is this is a marketing experience. Okay, you're going to expose your talent and ability to somebody, at least two people. The producer and the casting director are going to hear your work. And the agent is going to hear about your work if an agent sent to you. Because the casting director is going to call up the agent and say, don't ever send her here again. Or, hey, yeah, she was really good. Send her more often. And yeah. I wanted to ask you that. Uh, what kind of feedback does the agent who sends you get? Do you get feedback? I think it depends on the agent. Some are, are busy and don't care. And if they're freelancing with people, some of them are kind of hard. They're like, well, if you didn't book, that's all the feedback I needed. <laughs> but others are very nice and ask. They actually ask the casting director and the talent to call them back for you know, feedback from both sides. You could always take a little control here and ask the agent and say, well, do you want me to call you back after the audition to let you know how it went? And I have one agent who says yes every time I ask him that. He wants to know. He wants to know. And he asks the casting directors for feedback too. So you never really know which ones are getting feedback and which ones aren't. But I know that some of them engage in it and some want it especially when they're developing a talent and when they're trying to figure out, well, you know, should I work with that person freelance at all or should I sign that person if it's a bigger agent? So it does go on. So the agent may tell you, well, you know, the casting director thought that your reading was a little flat. So you may get some in the beginning. You also have to realize everyone has off days too. You're going to have a bad day and you're going to kick yourself for it. You know, I should have went to bed earlier and da 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 But, you know, it's going to happen. So... Yeah, so the, the feedback is important, but you've got to realize it's, it's not a class, and don't focus on the audition too much. You know, once it's over, let it go and start looking for the next one. The, the way to treat it, though, is like it's a marketing experience. Realize that in the beginning, it takes some people 40 or 50 auditions before they even book one job, and that's not unusual. When they get good, maybe they'll book one in 10, one in 20, etc. The reason it takes so much in the beginning is oftentimes people are just checking you out, and they're, they're sending you out just to get you experience. So sometimes you get sent out for some things that you're not really quite right for, and you wouldn't get it anyway. But that's fine, because you, you didn't get to meet that casting director yet, so you might as well go just to meet that person. If you'd been around the block and you knew this person for 10 years, then it would be a waste of time if you knew you would never get the job. You know, that's different. But when you're new, you, wanna, you, you don't know anyone, and there's hundreds of people to get to know. The number one method of sales and marketing in the 1950s was door-to-door -door sales. People would knock on people's doors and show them a vacuum cleaner, throw some dirt on the carpet, and show how well it picked it up. They would sell a lot of vacuum cleaners that way. Or they would go around with the World Book Encyclopedia. They would sell a lot of encyclopedias that way. And guess what? Nowadays, the Internet. Yeah, door-to-door -door has changed a little bit. Cable TV, the home shopping club is door-to-door. -door, right? So... An audition is door to door. You are actually going in, right? Okay. And, and the other thing that works, the, the thing that works best in sales is a free sample. How many people got that free sample of Crest when they were in college and still use Crest, right? So you've got the two top marketing tools on your side, door to door concept and a free sample. 
you go to this audition, forget that it's an audition. It's a marketing experience. You're going to maybe get to meet a producer if the producer's there. You're going to get to meet the casting director, perhaps a receptionist who's going to be a casting director. So you might get to meet three new people in your whole marketing experience. And you're going to give that free sample, and that casting director is going to say, you know what, she really knows how to read copy, and she really knew how to take direction. Too bad the client's daughter is going to do the voiceover. <laughs> but I would have chosen her. Then she's going to remember you for that thing that's coming up next week. And that's how you're going to get your second audition, because you got the first one, you see. And then you get your 30 auditions, you get your 40 auditions. And all of a sudden, one day, a producer calls you up and says, can you come over tomorrow at 2 o'clock and do a job for me? And you're like, how did you get my name? Well, you know, Susie over at such and such casting said you'd be right for this. Okay, and this is Susie who you auditioned for 10 times of those 40 and got to see your work. Okay, and Joe, producer, happened to call Susie and he said to her, you know what, I got tickets to this Broadway show and I give you these two tickets if you give me five names of people who can do this job because I don't have the budget to do the casting this week. I'll make it up to you. I'll, you know, I'll hire you for the job I'm doing in a month because it's a big job. Da da da. But can you give me a little favor here and give me the names of three people who can really do this copy? So she mentions your name because you did such a significantly good job at those 10 auditions. So she knows you can handle it. Plus, you've been marketing her all of this time. You've been sending her information about your career. She's heard your demo. She went to see you in a play. She knows you can do it. So she decides to give you the chance. So this is how it happens. Thanks again for listening to this particular class. I hope you enjoyed it and that it has been useful to you. We'll be producing more of these classes soon, so if you'd like to be involved in those classes, please join our mailing list. Once again, keep on learning. Practice, persist, succeed. Thanks again. This is David Zima.